All right, so um, again, I just wanted to kind of give you a quick rundown of what the Gauss-Binet theorem says. And um, to understand it, I think we need to talk a little bit about um, how to work with geodesics on a geometric surface. Um, a curve is, uh, geom and a geometric surface is, is a geodesic if gamma prime prime is zero. Now that is uh, Barrett O'Neill's notation for the, um, so all of these, by the way, are loosely based on this wonderful book. It's elementary differential geometry of revised second edition, which has some unfortunate problems with its printing, as you can see. This happens to pretty much all of them, unfortunately. But, <clears throat> great book. Very, very intuitive. And um, anyway, so um, this is his notation for the, uh, for the covariant derivative of the velocity field. Uh, let's, let me look, let me show you here specifically a little bit of details. So if we have the, you know, because E1 and E2, the adapted frame to the surface, build as a basis for the tangent space. If we have a curve in the surface, the velocity and the acceleration can be both expanded um, in term, well, the velocity and the covariant derivative of the velocity are both, again, tangents to the surface. So you can expand them in terms of the frame. You can find, of course, V1, V2 to get the, 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 the velocity. Uh, these are functions on the surface. And then you can also find an A1 and A2 such that the <clears throat> derivative, again, this is actually the covariant derivative of the velocity field along alpha is, is equal to those. And so it's geodesic if and only if the, the A1 and A2 are zero. When you actually get into the details of that, which you have done a little bit in some of your homework, it looks like this. So, you know, the, the derivative of a vector field, it's the derivative of the component, and then, you know, the the part of the second component which rotates into the first depends on the connection form at the, the connection form describes how your basis vectors are rotating one into the other on the surface. That's what the connection coefficients mean. Um, so you pick up this connection coefficient term that, that has to do with how E1 is changing, not so much with how Y is changing, but of course the change in Y also has to incorporate the change in the frame and that's what the connection coefficients do for you. Um, Anyway, once the dust settles, this is your geodesic equation. <laughs> In terms of the EFs and Gs, that's what you got to solve to find the geodesics on a, on a surface in R3. So again, um, well, here's some technical stuff. The geometric surface is complete, provided every maximal geodesic is defined on, on all of R. Uh, let's see here. So, a sphere, I think a helix. Anyway, by the way, you can use the exponential to, you can use geodesics to define the exponential on a surface and also more generally a manifold, Ramanian manifold. The exponential is the, uh, it's the geodesic, um, the, the exponential at P acting on V, it's the geodesic in the V direction at parameter one. That's the definition of the exponential on a Ramanian manifold. And, but anyway, we haven't obviously got into that, but that's a kind of different exponential than the one you've seen, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, if E1 and E2 is a frame field and alpha is a constant speed curve, then alpha prime and E2 are never orthogonal. And, excuse me, and E2 and alpha prime are never orthogonal. All right. Um, if a1 equals to zero, then a2 equals zero. Hence, alpha is geodesic. So that's a kind of nice criteria for finding a geodesic. It's uh, it's enough to get just one of the a's being zero. The other one being zero automatically follows. So that kind of cuts your work in half. I mean, you still got a horrible differential equation you got to solve to get the a, but yay. All right, anyway, he's got a whole section on these Clairo parameterizations and lots of like tools and so forth to do it. That's not really what we're after. I just want to introduce the idea. <clears throat> so you got a surface. It's got, on it, it's got an adapted, adapted frame, E1 and E2. They're tangent to the surface, right? And um, if you have a, a curve on that surface, then 
the tangent um, is, of course, going to be b prime, just like I did to start it today. And the normal, though, is going to be built from jt. And j is the rotation operator induced from m on m. So this is really something a little bit different. You see, so if this is beta, right? then this is E1, all right? That's the tangent. But you see, J is a rotation by 90 degrees induced from the orientation. So if the orientation basically is upward, then this, I'm trying to make it tangent to the surface, but 90 degrees back, that would be JE1. On the other hand, that, that's for this DM, so to speak, if you'll allow me to write dm in terms of its kernel, in other words, as a normal vector field. On the other hand, if dm points the other way down, then j would rotate e1 like that, the opposite direction. So you have that j e1 may or may not be the normal from the Frenet theory. Frenet theory says that the unit normal is towards the inner, towards the center of the osculating circle, which you can, which will fit, fit, the, fit the curve. But this notion of normal, the, the, the uh, JE1 is just based on the surface, not the curve, which direction you're rotating 90 degrees in the tangent plane. So that, that's a departure from the Frenet theory. And, but almost everything's the same. It's just now T prime is kappa G, <laughs> kappa G, uh, kappa G N, and this could be positive or negative depending on which direction T prime points, whether it points, you know, whether it, it points, uh, in the Frenet normal sense or opposite the Frenet normal sense. Um, so in the case that um, in the case that the kappa G is positive, I guess that would mean, well, I know again, normal is defined by rotating around the, uh, the normal vector field. So, <clears throat> so anyway, there you go. That's, that's your curvature, geodesic curvature, as it's called. So again, here's a couple pictures. If it's positive, if the geodesic curvature is positive, that means that T is turning towards J of T. So let's see here. Here's T. Here's towards. So T is turning towards J of T. So see that? That would be positive curvature. Over here, T is turning away from J of T, so it would be negative curvature. These are the two, two signs that are possible. Now, this corollary is you could argue that this corollary is the, the gauss bonnet theorem. I mean, it's a, this is a very large working part in the theorem. So if we have beta is a unit speed curve in the oriented region, um, and we have a frame field E1, E2, if B is the angle from E1 to beta prime, so we're saying E1 is not based on the curve, it's based on the adapted frame to the surface, right? So we can basically take that as our sort of moving positive x-axis. And you can sweep angles from that to your tangent, and that will define phi. So it's sort of like an angle of inclination, except what, what's, what's horizontal is, you know, depending on where the E1 is pointing. Um, but the theorem, here, the corollary rather, says that the, the, the um, geodesic curvature is d phi ds plus omega 1, 2 beta prime, where this is the connection coefficient you guys have had some homework on. Um, so, for example, in, um, if we were where the connection coefficients were all zero, for example, Euclidean space, right, with respect to a boring Cartesian frame, then the curvature would just be d phi ds, which is a definition you'll see in some, some Calc 3 books. The curvature is defined to be the rate of change of the angle um, phi with respect to the arc length, where phi is defined to be the angle between the, uh, the tangent and, uh, you know, the, the positive x direction or something like that. So. Anyway, the proof doesn't especially concern us, but it's not that complicated. <clears throat> so a regular curve um, is a geodesic if and only if it has constant speed and the geodesic, geodesic curvature zero. So geodesics are the curves with zero geodesic curvature. 
that's kind of nice, right? That beats the pants off uh, trying to just solve that ugly differential equation. I mean, this is a much nicer description to work with. A curve that satisfies these horrible differential equation for the A's, or a curve which is constant speed and has zero curvature. I think I prefer the latter, you know? Um, definition, if we have a curve going from I to M with zero, uh, zero geodesic curvature, this is a pre-geodesic. Um, so if alpha is reparametrized to unit speed, then it's an actual geodesic. So a pre-geodesic would be zero curvature, but maybe it's got speed two, or maybe the speed is variable or something stupid. Yeah, exactly like that. Right, right, something like that. All right, so that's just a warm up. Now we can state the Gauss Binet theorem. Well, part of it anyway. We're, we're working. We'll, we'll eventually get to the Gauss Binet theorem. My, my time is limited, so we'll get there soon. But um, I need a few more definitions. If we have a curve alpha, we can t describe the total geodesic curvature along the curve to be the integral of the curvature over ds. So we can calculate the total geodesic curvature along a curve by integrating curvature with respect to arc length. Um, for example, if you calculate the total geodesic curvature along the circle, which I was just looking at a second ago, it's got total geodesic curvature of 2 pi. So that's kind of satisfying. Um, if we went clockwise instead of counterclockwise, we get minus 2 pi. Lemma. And this is essentially the corollary we were just looking at integrated. So if we look at the total curvature along a curve, it's equal to the difference in the inclination angles at the endpoints. Again, that's measured with respect to the E1 frame. So that's kind of ad hoc, but it's standard, all right? And um, plus the integral of the 1, 2 form along the curve. So there's this, the total geodesic curvature along a line, along a, a curve in the curve. It depends on the angle of inclination at the, difference in the angle of inclination at the endpoints, plus the integral of the, the connection 1, 2 form along the curve. That's kind of neat. And the proof really is just integrating that corollary I showed you in the last lecture. Um, so this is what's called a, um, I think a paving. So if you take like a little rectangle that goes along the U and then along the V and along the U and along the V in a sort of natural rectangular, well, rectangle in the parameter domain, of course it maps to like a curved rectangle up on the surface with respect to the patch, the UV patch. Well, this X, the boundary of X is alpha plus beta minus gamma minus delta because of the orientation issue here. All right, so what, so whatever. <clears throat> so definition, um, if we have X as a patch, um, well, this is a two segment if the R is actually a rectangle from A to B from C to D, and so the U ranges from A to B, V ranges from C to D, and these are the, the edges, okay? So he, he defines integrals of two forms over such things earlier in the book, okay? It's my, my, ooh, that's really, really sticky stuff is, that strawberry soda is, I think it's stickier than other sodas. All right, so anyway, so you might notice that the boundary um, of X is in fact the simple closed curve. So what's the total geodesic curvature over the boundary of X? Um, it's, if it's a single curve, we'd be done, but the corners here matter. So we have, to, we have to think about the total geodesic curvature around, you know, a patch, which could look, I mean, a, what, what, I forgot what this stupid thing was called. What was it called? I just said it a minute ago. A paving, right, yeah. So um, you might call it like a tile, right? I mean, it's kind of like a, but um, anyway, so, you know, each, each one of these, it's, you know, the angle of inclination at the endpoints is going to be picked up when we actually do the integral. We apply that theorem that I just wrote down. It's going to be based on the integral of omega 1, 2 over each line segment, but also 
the difference in the angles of inclination at the ending and starting point each time, right? And um, <clears throat> so, you know, this, if you, you, can, you can look at C as being the boundary of X with cut corners. So technically this is not equal to that. It's an abuse, but the um, boundary of X ne neglects the turning. The, um, we have to be careful about that turning. You can't just neglect the turning. The turning matters. Um, so if you, if, if, you <laughs> if you replace these with, um, with just a, a smoothed out version, you might trick yourself into missing important terms. <laughs> Funny. Anyway, um, the vertices, P1, P2, P3, P4, are exterior, have exterior angles epsilon j. So like here's, so here's alpha like that, and then beta picks up going in that direction. So the angle to sweep from the tangent to the new tangent, that's, ep that's the exterior angle, epsilon 2. There's also like sweeping from delta, or rather from minus delta to alpha, that's exterior angle 1. You got one of these exterior angles at every vertice. Um, they're related to the interior angles. Um, well, anyway, let me draw a picture here. Well, so XU is in the direction of E1. So let's see here. What does this say? It says E3 um, plus theta 3, which is actually the phi, quote unquote. I think this. So I think this is actually phi. Is the, the theta three would be my phi? I think as I defined it earlier. <sighs> anyway, going on, going on. <clears throat> so you got to look at these pictures, and we get to the theorem. Theorem says that if we have a one-to-one -one regular two segment on a geometric surface M. DM is the area form determined by the patch. Then the integral of the area form times the, this is the Gaussian curvature. Well, that's equal to the integral of the geodesic curvature around the edge, right? Plus the sum of the exterior angles at the vertices. And all of that is equal to 2 pi. Now, if you take this, you can reformulate it as saying, the integral of the Gaussian curvature of the surface plus the integral of the geodesic curvature of the edge is equal to the sum of the interior angles minus 2 pi. This is what's often called the gauss bonnet interior angle theorem. What happens when you apply this theorem to a, to a, to a, uh, a paving where the edges are geodesics? If the edges are geodesics, then the geodesic curvature is by construction zero. So what this says is that the integral of the Gaussian curvature is equal to the sum of the exterior angles minus 2 pi. So if you had constant curvature, what would it say? Constant curvature. We'd have, we'd have curvature times the area of M, right? Curvature times the, well, the area of what I've called X here, huh? is equal to what? It would be equal to the sum of the interior angles uh, minus 2 pi. Now, if we're, with, we're, if we're where curvature is 0, if we're in curvature 0, what's that say? That says the sum of the interior angles to a rectangle is what? equal to 2 pi. This is not especially surprising, right? In fact, each one of them is 90 degrees. But um, <clears throat> so we can, you can, you can get from this to a, I'm trying to think of how to get from this thing to the, uh, the tri I want the triangle version, you know? I'm not sure I have that written out in my notes. This is just the proof of the theorem. Actually, I, th I think I still haven't really gotten to the Gauss-Binet theorem. Um, the Gauss-Binet theorem actually is something a little bit more than that. That's just, at the moment, that's just a connection between the curvature and the interior angles. But there's, there's more. Um, if D is a rectangular decomposition of a compact surface, 
and the, what that means is you take the surface and you divide it up into a bunch of rectangles which cover it. Then the number of vertices, edges, and faces um, give you an integer, v minus e plus f, that's called the Euler characteristic. And you can prove through delicate combinatorial arguments that uh, that's independent of your choice of rectal, reg, any, rectal, any rectangularization that you find of your surface, you'll get the same Euler characteristic. Um, so for example, a sphere you could triangulate with basically a blown out tetrahedron and um, that, that, that has four vertices, six edges, four faces, so its Euler characteristic is two. Likewise, you could also inscribe a cube inside the sphere and blow it up, but that would give you another rectangularization of the sphere. It also has Euler characteristic two. It's not an accident. Torus has Euler characteristic zero. Um, all right, so here's the Gauss-Binet theorem. Gauss-Binet theorem actually says the following. It says, the total Gaussian curvature M of a compact orientable geometric surface is two pi times Euler characteristic. So this is a very, very interesting theorem because on the left-hand side, we have something which is completely differential geometric, about the curvature of a geometric surface. And on the right-hand side, we have something which is merely topological that concerns the triangularization or, or rectangularization. And again, this is basically just built over the thing I was calling the Gauss-Binet theorem, but that's not quite accurate. The, that's, I guess, more properly a technical result involving the Gaussian, cur Gaussian curvature and geodesic curvature of curves. But to prove it, you got to actually get into that stuff. And if you look at the, there's a relation between the interior angles and the faces and edges that you can make explicit. And so you connect the two worlds and out pops the Gauss-Binet theorem. So meh, curses. Well, here, let me show you one last thing and I'll shut up for today. Forever, actually. What's that? Say again? I just did. Uh huh. So, first of all, um, these are surfaces. Well, I don't know. The, um, I'm not sure um, I understand your question yet. Right, if two homeomorphic surfaces would have the same other characteristic is true, yeah. We could uh, take the rectangularization of one and uh, basically just transfer it over. Oh, here it is. So a more general, I mean, the, the, the theorem is the one that I talked about today in these notes. It's nice because rectangularizations are much easier to think about than triangularizations because they're rectangles. So they kind of naturally play together with our parameterization, right? But you can prove that the integral over a polygon, um, k dm, I think this may actually have to do with your question, plus the integral over the boundary of a polygon um, of the geodesic curvature ds, all right? It's 
um, plus the sum of the exterior angles over the, the, the polygonal region. Well, that's equal to 2 pi, the Euler characteristic of the polygon, polygonal region of the geometric surface. So if you take a triangle, right, which is a special kind of polygon, we get this theorem. Um, and let's see here. So we, and let's suppose we're supposed to take uh, k equals to constant, all right? And let's take these to be geodesics. So a geodesic triangle, which would mean that the geodesic curvature is zero, right? In that special case, we get that the Gaussian curvature times the area of the triangle, right, is equal to 2 pi um, times the Euler characteristic of a triangle, which is what? Oh, stink. That is not true. I'm sorry, guys. I've, I've messed it up. In the case of a triangle, I can't even... Ah, well, okay, fine. It, well, son of a gun. I'm sorry, guys. The um, it's not exactly this. Th anyway, I, well, if you want to read page three seventy eight and three seventy nine of Barrett O'Neill's text, I can't do it all in here at the moment. But long story short, from these things, we get the following theorem: the integral of the Gaussian curvature over a triangle is plus the integral over the boundary of the triangle of the geodesic curvature that's equal to 2 pi minus the sum of the exterior angles I'm sorry let me just get straight to the point it's equal to it's equal to the sum of the interior angles minus pi all right, so then you can, see, you can see why the famous result appears then. If we have, if we use a geodesic triangle, then this is zero. And if we have curvature zero, like in Euclidean space, then we have the sum of the interior angles in the triangle's pi. On the other hand, if we're in, and then you can go, I mean, you can either have a positive curvature or a negative curvature space, right? If we had a positive curvature space, then that would say that the sum of the angles is larger than pi, right? On the other hand, if we had a negative curvature space, that would say the sum of the interior angles was less than pi, because that would mean that the interior angles got beat by minus pi in the difference. So spheres are positive curvature? Right. And yes, spheres, in fact, are positive curvature 1 over k squared. So, you know, a nice, if you want to form a geodesic triangle in a sphere, use great circles. Your, uh, these two guys and the, the equator, this one and this one, it's a nice geodesic triangle. And in fact, I believe those are all right angles. And so this, well, you got pi over 2 plus pi over 2 plus pi over 2, which is what? So this minus pi is equal to what? It's pi over 2, right? And that's supposed to be, would be the integral of the curvature, which I'm telling you is 1 over r squared <coughs> times the, the volume form, which you guys did not calculate. Right? Well, you, um, um, I'm glad this came up because I wanted to look at that with you guys just before we part ways here. Because there's something easy there that you guys are not aware of. That was this one. But anyway, getting back to here. So the volume form, that just gives you the area over that part. What's the area of this piece?
it's 4 pi r squared, what proportion of the whole surface area is on that part of the sphere? Eighth. Check that out, yo. Pi over 2. Pi over 2. And that's the interplay between the Euler characteristic and the Gaussian curvature. But, okay, th this one I asked you guys to calculate the volume of M that was implicitly defined. Now, if we use Cartesian coordinates, it's kind of, it's kind of tricky, I admit it. Um, I was able to figure it out because I was just looking at it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to solve, uh, how's it go? Oh, DF wedge the volume, right? DF wedge the, the, vo in the, the volume is an area form technically, it's a surface, right? It's a two form. But um, DF wedge, this volume form is supposed to be 2R, this is the length of the DF, DX wedge, DY wedge, DZ. So, okay, so DF is this, volume M, I don't know what that is, let's call it something, ABC, right? So I'm looking for this wedge, ABC, that. And if you think through it, um, a nice solution, I mean, that w simplifies to X times A plus Y times B plus Z times C, wedge that is that. All right, and it's subject to the sphere. So the sphere, I have x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. So, gee, why don't I just put x equal to a equal to x over r, b equal to y over r, c equal to z over r. If I do that, then that gives me, you know, x squared plus y squared plus z squared divided by r, which is r. And then I solve that equation star. I admit that this calculation is a little bit kind of like, like, what if it were not a sphere, and I was trying to do this? It seems like it could be kind of hard. Yeah, I did try to, like, look, and I misread the question. Because it's like, what kind of misread is the volume function? Because it's like, blah. And I missed, for some reason, thought that it meant the entire left side. Was the volume function not the right? There was just literally volume M. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I knew you misread it. I just, I mean, so I, I, I believe that. Yeah, so, but a better way to do this is to use spherical coordinates. In spherical coordinates, you see um, dx wedge dy wedge dz is actually rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta wedged, wedged. And so my f is rho squared. My df is 2 rho d rho. So when I look at the same condition in spherical coordinates, it gives me 2 rho d rho wedge the volume is equal to 2 rho rho squared sine phi d rho d, d phi d theta. But look at that. I mean, if I'm going to have this equal to this, well, you can... You could do both, you could interior, you know, take the interior operator on partial, partial phi on both sides, and that would get you volume phi, volume M, is that. And so you can just read from it the volume form for a sphere. And that, of course, is exactly um, the wedge product version of ds vector is equal to r squared sine phi d phi d theta, which we derived through very different looking means in calculus 3. Of course, if you're a glutton for punishment, you could put spherical coordinates into this and derive that this reduces to that. You could look at the spherical coordinate formulas going from rho, uh, rho phi theta space to x, y, z space and pull this form back to get that. In other words, ha! So many, see, you have so many options now. Anyway, thanks guys. I appreciate your patience. I will see you at the final. Do not despair. Everyone here can make points on the final. Just do your best. <laughs>